This iPhone is a truly remarkable device. It has about a half a trillion transistors inside it. According to Jack Gansel, if you tried to build this out of 1950s technology, ENIAC technology, it would require 170 vehicle assembly buildings simply to house the vacuum tubes. It would weigh as much as 2,500 Nimitz-class aircraft carriers. It would consume a full terawatt of power, requiring 500 2-gigawatt nuclear power plants, the biggest plants we build. And it would cost a mere $50 trillion the economic output of the world. And once we had built it, there would be no one to call. It's remarkable for another reason. This device embodies Einstein's dilemma, the theoretical dissonance between general relativity and quantum mechanics, because this device can't do its job without both. All iPhones contain a GPS receiver that calculates its position on the surface of the planet to within a few inches. How? Imagine that you're in the woods on a road that connects two distant towns. Each of these towns has a clock tower and the two clock towers keep perfect time. At noon, they will both strike their gongs. You can use this fact to determine your position on the road if you can hear both clocks chime and if you happen to know the speed of sound. You simply wait until noon and listen for the two clock towers to chime. The clock tower you are closest to is the one you will hear first. Sound travels at about 340 meters per second. So now imagine that you hear the clock in front of you chime one second before you hear the clock behind you chime. That means you're 170 meters past the midpoint between the two towns. If you had a map of the road, you could plot your position precisely. The reason this works with two clocks is that a road only has one dimension. If you want to find your location in a two-dimensional space, you'd need three clocks. And if you want to find yourself somewhere on a three-dimensional space, like the planet Earth, you need at least four clocks. So we took a bunch of atomic clocks, we put them into satellites, and we launched them into orbits. And we arranged the orbits such that anywhere on the planet, any time of day, there are at least five or six of them in view. There's about 30 of these satellites up there. And each of the satellites continually broadcasts its precise location and the time. My iPhone listens to the time signals being broadcast by those satellites and it notices that they arrive slightly out of sync. The reason for this is that the time signals move at the speed of light and the satellites are all at different distances from my iPhone. So my iPhone measures the differences in arrival time of the time signals. My iPhone uses those small differences in arrival time in order to calculate my position on the Earth in exactly the same way that we calculated our position on the road by measuring the arrival time of the two clock chimes. But there's a problem. You see, the satellites are whipping around the Earth at over 17,000 miles per hour relative to my iPhone. Now, special relativity says that my iPhone will see those clocks running a bit slow because they're moving so fast. And so my iPhone must take this into account. There's another problem too. Those satellites are several hundred miles above the surface of the Earth. And according to general relativity, the space-time curvature out there will cause clocks to run faster than down here on the planet. My iPhone is going to have to take that into account too. So in order for my iPhone to correctly determine my position, it's got to do calculations in both special and general relativity. Cool. But how does it do those calculations? Well, it does them in a computer. And that computer is made up of transistors. 
A transistor can be thought of as a switch that turns electric current on or off. It does this by altering the conductivity of the silicon atoms within the crystal that it's made from. It accomplishes that change by taking advantage of the quantum characteristics of the atoms and electrons inside that crystal. The way this works is fascinating, and we are liable to end up talking about it later in a future episode. For now, I simply want to make the point that the calculations of both special and general relativity are being performed by a computer whose operation depends upon quantum mechanics. Now remember, it was Einstein in 1905 who started both the quantum mechanics and the relativity revolutions. And this is ironic, because while these two theories are the most successful scientific theories we have, they are wildly incompatible with each other. Relativity describes the universe as a curved continuum, the space-time continuum. The word continuum means exactly what you'd expect it to mean. It means something that is unbroken, continuous, something that has continuity. The equations of relativity describe smooth curves in energy, space, and time. Quantum mechanics is all about discontinuity. A quantum is a discontinuous chunk of space, time, or energy. A continuum cannot be made out of quanta, and a quantum has no existence in a continuum. The two theories disagree about their basic assumptions of what the universe is. They couldn't be any more dissimilar. And that was Einstein's dilemma. And it's also one of the biggest problems that faces science today. Yet here they are in my hand, working together almost perfectly, so well that I can get into my car and travel to destinations relying solely on their guidance, blissfully unaware that these two theories are utterly incompatible.